Das ist so bei dem Problem. Ähm, so if we go up just a little bit in the medulla, I, I tell you right now that so I said cranial nerve 8, the stupid appropriate, was on the ponto medullary junction, meaning 9, 10, 11, and 12 are going to be in the medulla. Right? So if we move up a little bit in the medulla, um, this is 10. If we look at 9, oh, if we look at 9, it looks almost the same thing. 9 has 5 functional components as well, just like 10. It uses all the same, or just about the same nuclei, except the, except the one. Instead of the dorsal motor nucleus of 10, the preganglionic paraphernalic <coughs> nucleus of 9 is called the inferior salivatory nucleus. <coughs> So there's the inferior, it's in the same place as the dorsal motor nucleus of 10, it's just a little higher and it's specific to 9. The inferior salivatory nucleus. All the rest of them is the same. Spinal thalamic uh, attracted nucleus of 5, solitary, ambiguous, all the rest of them are the same. Okay? What they do is um, nine goes to the larynx, pharynx, just like ten. So that's coming from ambiguous. Nine up also is related to the outer ear. Here. Nine goes to brachiomeric. Small muscles like the stylopharyngeus and weird things like that, I believe that's nine. It doesn't matter, it's in the neck, I mean, so what? Where the only difference is where the dorsal motor nucleus of 10 went to the heart, lungs, and the GI tract, the inferior salivatory nucleus. What's Autonomic structure. Cranial nerve nine provides autonomic to what structure? Yeah, it's the parotid glands. Is that what you were pointing? You were pointing at the mastoid process. <laughs> okay, Michelle. All right, so that <laughs> it's the parotid glands. Salivation, salivatory. Oh, fancy that. Taste, posterior one third of the tongue. Ten was the base of the tongue, so move up a little bit, posterior one third. When we get to what's the anterior two thirds? The facial. What nucleus do you think the facial nucleus uses for taste? It's the same thing, the solitary nucleus. Okay. All right, so move on. We're going up a little bit more. First to summarize, apparently. <laughs> here they all are. <laughs> okay. Not only here they all are, they goes all the way up to the um, mesocell. These are all of them. These are all of the cranial nerve nuclei. All the way up to cranial nerve three. Cranial nerve two doesn't use the brain stem. Cranial nerve one doesn't use the brain stem. So three through twelve over here. One thing about the um, cranial nerve nuclei you need, you need to be aware of is that with rare exception, they're bilaterally innovated. So if you have a stroke of your precentral gyrus on the right side, that innervates your left side, right? So your upper extremity, your lower extremity is going to be paralyzed. How come 
extraocular eye movement muscles, the tongue, chewing, swallowing, are never involved in a stroke because they're bilaterally innovated. You can knock out one side, and that's fine. We'll just feed it, we'll run it from the other side. I said with rare exception, there's an exception right here that we're not going to worry about, accessory nucleus, because you have other things that can drive that. The one that really comes into play, though, is that lower half of the nucleus of the facial nerve that goes to the lower half of the muscle, the lower half of the face. It's only innervated by one side. The other side, contralateral, right? That's really the only one. So the tongue muscles, if we look at the hypermuscle nucleus, the tongue is never affected in a stroke. Swallowing. Sorry. What is what does affect the swallowing when people have stroke? So when they have a stroke, what do you mean? Like a lot of people have strokes have trouble swallowing. So if it's not the innervation that is affected in, what causes that? We're talking about the innervation of the cranial nerve. What else is down oh, here? Okay. So you have all the, you know, the ansa cervicalis innervates all these neck muscles that are related to swallowing. It's not the pharyngeal constrictors. It's the other non-cranial nerve muscles that, are, that affect, uh, affect swallowing. Okay? Here's eight, the vestibular cochlear. Um, I don't want to go a whole lot into this other than to say the um, vestibular apparatus, bipolar neurons from the vestibular apparatus have a ganglion out here in the temporal bone, send their processes into those four nuclei. I mentioned, I think, before lunch, that the vestibular spinal tract comes out of that one of the nuclei. It's called lateral vestibular, in case we're on Jeffrey, it's a lateral vestibular spinal. Vestibular nucleus. There's another pathway that comes out of the vestibular nucleus, though, that goes up. It's called the MLF. Remember the MLF, and I, that picture I showed you? Got the hypoglossal nucleus, and right there immediately was a little fiber crack called the medial longitudinal fasciculus, MLF, Anna, okay, all right, I just want to make sure you look near suicidal. <laughs> what the MLF does, what the MLF does, it connects the vestibular nucleus with cranial nerves 6, 4, and 3. It goes up and connects the nucleus of 6.3 to the vestibular apparatus. So that basketball sitting right there, 6, 4, and 3 control what? Extra eyes. Extra eye movement. So the thing that tells you where your head is in space is connected to your EOMs. So if I'm looking at that basketball there, I can keep my vision locked on that basketball, no matter where my head is in space. That's my MLF doing that. <coughs> Did we not talk about doll's eyes? Yes. Yeah. Doll's eyes is interruption of the MLF. So if the damage to your brain stem is significant enough to damage the MLF, you'll have doll's eyes. Well, I think we did a little demonstration right here on the table. I don't remember who it was, it you? Okay. That's kind of cool, huh? Okay. 
And you know, by the way, I'm I'm speaking slowly <laughs> and by design, so you get this. If, if you want me to speed up, I'll be glad to speed up. No. <laughs> I just I just want to make sure I. Okay. The, the, the long fiber tracks that we talked about yesterday, because they're in the medulla, let's uh, bring them up again. This one right here, you can recognize it as the dorsal column because everything's on the same side until you get to nucleus crossulus and cuneatus. There's the sensory decussation. There's the creation of the medial lemniscus that, as you said earlier correctly, goes all the way to the thalamus. If you lesion here, you'll have it's a lateral sensory loss. If you lesion here, you'll have contralateral sensory loss. Did I say hearing? Sens no. Sensory. Sensory. Okay? Interestingly, like, where's Paul? Oh, he's back there. <laughs> when Paul and I had our butts together, we were facing opposite directions. Note that there is somatotopy to the to this. We said your your butt here is medially. You see the lower dermatomes are medially. Once they synapse in the nuclei, the MLF, I mean, excuse me, the medial lemniscus stays somatotopic too. So that arrangement of uh, you know um, upper dermatomes to lower dermatomes, you kind of twist as you go up the neuraxis. I don't care that you memorize that. I don't know which one's which when you get up here, but it's kind of interesting that if they, you take the MLF with all these tens of thousands of neurons in them, there is an order to it. If you look at the uh, spinothalamic tract, um, there's a substantia gelatinosa, lamina 2, it crosses in the anterior white commissure, enters the lateral spinothalamic tract, goes all the way up through the brain stem, again to the VPL of the thalamus. Corticospinal tract uh, from top down. Do <laughs> 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 you hear them chanting out there this morning? Yes. I mean, you people are free. You're, you're college graduates. This is what you do? <laughs> <laughs> Corticospinal tract uh, originates precentral gyrus, uh, descends in the cerebellar, I mean, excuse me, cerebral peduncles, crosses in the pyramidal decussation, continues down at the pyramids. We'll talk more about the corticospinal tract when we get up to the cortex itself. But this is a general outline of it. So let's move up a little bit to the inferior palms. Remember we were talking about the difference between this fiber bundle and that fiber bundle, meaning that these guys must terminate in here. If we take a cross section of the palms, you see all these nuclei this is the ventral surface. You see all these nuclei. So the cortical, so there is a cortical pontine relationship. And from here, these axons will go in the, me the middle cerebellar peduncle to go into this cerebellum. So there's three types of descending cortical fibers. The cortical spinal, 
is corticopontine. And they're the ones that end in the nuclei of the brain stem, like the hypoglossal that I showed you, the bilateral thing. If it ends in the brain stem, it's called corticobulbar. So corticobulbar, corticopontine, corticospinal. Those are the three projections of the precentral gyrus. So we've done uh, cranial nerves 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Let's go to 7. 7 is right here. The nucleus of 7 is right there. The odd thing about the nucleus of 7 is the axons, when they leave it, instead of just coming straight out, they go medially and up and around the nucleus of 6. So here's six coming out right here. Remember six on the brain stem, the whole brain stem is medial, right? Six is coming out right there. Seven fibers go up and around, and when they go up and around, this is the fourth ventricle, they form that facial colliculus. The floor and the fourth ventricle. That's what it's formed by. And then out. What do you think those, what do you think the nucleus of nerve seven does? They show <laughs> expression. Okay, so these are innervating the muscles of facial expression. just like 9 and 10 do. The facial nerve has five, uh, not, uh, five components just like 9 and 10 do. They're all the same as 9 and 10. Except for one. The preganglionic parasympathetics of 7. The preganglionic parasympathetics of 10 was the dorsal motor nucleus of 10. Preganglionic parasympathetics of 9 was the inferior salivatory nucleus. What do you think the preganglionic parasympathetic nucleus of 7 is called? Stay it, Stacy. <laughs> superior, superior salivatory nucleus, because what does seven innervate that's related to salivation? The submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands, also the lacrimal gland. Right? It's that simple. Here also is our descending tract and nucleus of five. That's still in front. Here's the medial lemniscus. Remember that inferior olivary nucleus down there was a relay going to the cerebellum. There's a superior olivary nucleus right here. We're not going to worry about. Don't just forget it. Just forget it. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. Okay. If you look on an actual uh, section through here, stained specimen. You can see the large tracks in the nuclei, nuclear groups of the ponds. That's what forms that big fat bulge. This here is the functional part of the brainstem, the ponds right here. Not much, uh, pretty small. And you really can't make out the tracks on here like they say. I think they're just BSing with you. You do see the trigeminal nerve that's coming out of the substance of the ponds in this line. If you look at this uh, illustration right here, this kind of puts everything together. Here's the, just break it down, break it down. You, don't look at it all at once and say, oh shit. <laughs> that's what you're doing. 
look at it parts. Say, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me look at the front here. This would be pons right here. In the pons is a corticospinal tract. We know that. The rest of the pons must be the cortical bulbar and cortical punti stuff. Uh, here's the medial lemniscus. We know that. Here's six right there. There's seven up and around like that. Here's the nucleus that he said don't worry about. Here's the spinal tract and trigeminal nucleus right here. Here's the vestibular nuclei here. See, you know all these things now. You just don't look at it at once. Take it apart. And the way I would study this, one other thing is the cerebellar peduncles here, because you're connecting the brainstem with the cerebellum back here. What I was telling T uh, at lunch here was that the way I would study this is I'd cover up the answers and just look at the arrows, you know, start naming structures. That way you get an appreciation for what's in the middle, well, where things are. Uh, you have to know what they do, but at least where they are, because I can promise you on the test, there are going to be some lesions here. You know, if you have a lesion down in the low medulla in the midline, what's it going to affect? It's going to affect your tongue. It's not going to affect your face, your, the touch on your face, because that's lateral. If you have a lesion laterally, your tongue's going to work. Matter of fact, there's a, um, if you look down into medulla, is this is the medulla right here, the low medulla. There's the anterior spinal artery. It supplies the midline. The posteriors are already formed. They supply the lateral part. If you infarct that, it's called the medial medullary syndrome. You don't need to write this down. I didn't cover it. I was telling you that neuroanatomically, clinically, if you know where things are, you can, you can know where the problem is. Just like Pavey's dorsalis, the tertiary syphilis thing is the dorsal uh, posterior columns. That's going to be proprioception and in touch. The medial medullary system, uh, syndrome here will affect the hypoglossal nuclei. It affects the medial meniscus. The lateral medullary syndrome affects balance because of the vestibular nuclei and the sensation related to the trigeminal tract. They're very specific syndromes. You can Google them. So that's how I would study it. Okay. Here's uh, uh, seven here. The, the different nuclei of seven that we talked about. Here's the, the nucleus going to the muscles of facial expression. Here's a superior salivatory nucleus right there. Superior salivatory nucleus. We've got solitarius, ambiguous, it's all the same thing. And the, the spinal tract nucleus of five. So seven, nine, and ten all share the same nuclei except for the preganglionic parasympathetics. If you'll notice here, uh, up here, from coming down from the cortex, you've got this bilateral innervation right there of that facial motor nucleus. Well, remember when I was doing the cortical bulbar, showing you that thing about the bilateral thing? I said the bottom half of the face? That's here. So, Bell's palsy is a lesion of the facial motor nucleus or of the entire facial nerve. It's represented by number two here. 
if you lesion number two, like with Bell's palsy, the entire face is not going to work on that half. It's an ipsilateral, you're going to lose everything on that side, from the forehead to the maxillary to the mandibular. Everything on that side is going to droop. If you have a stroke, which would represent number one, See this, this neuron here that's going to the lower half? You're going to knock that out. So the lower half of your face is going to droop. But the neuron that's going to your frontalis muscle here, it's innervated by both sides. So you can still raise your eyebrows in a stroke. You can't in Bell's palsy. I can tell the difference. So if somebody comes into your clinic and say, my face is drooping, look for these lines on their forehead. If they stop, that's a good sign. If you can't raise your eyebrows, that's a uh, eyebrow, that's a good sign. If you can raise your eyebrow, that's a bad sign. Six. Six goes to what muscle? LR6. Lateral rectus. Comes out, just goes to one place, one muscle. Lateral rectus. Rotates the eyeball laterally. It's a pure muscle. Or pure movement. That's all we got to say about that. Mm -hmm. It's bilaterally innervated from above, so you don't knock that out. You don't knock out lateral gaze with a stroke. Five. We're going to move up to five here. Five is interesting. We only have a few more cranial nerves to go here. We don't have to do two in, in one, right? We don't have to do that because that's not brainstem. But let's do five. Five. Here we have five in the trigeminal ganglion, the big trigeminal ganglion, the ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular divisions, and it's all, remember all that from anatomy? I know. Good. Uh, these, these are like, dors this is like a dorsal root ganglion. Central processes go in. Here's our big, long spinal tract and nucleus of five. Okay, so there are three, three different parts. There's a there's a mesencephalon. I said earlier when I showed you that first slide that it went all the way from the mesencephalon down to the spinal cord. That's what's represented here. You've got mesencephalic, you've got the pontine area, which is called the main sensory nucleus of five or principal nucleus of five. And then down here you've got the um, spinal cord and the medulla. And they carry different uh, sensations. Pain temperature is the lower part, the spinal tract and, and nucleus of five. Pain and temperature, because we're talking about the skin of the face, right? Touch is the chief or main or principal nucleus in the palms. That's, that's touch. And in the mesencephalic nucleus, is proprioception. How do you have proprioception in your face? You know you're smiling. Mm -hmm. Or my face is drooping. You know your face is a drooping. Or also chewing. Mastication <coughs> is five, right? So there must be a motor component of five. <coughs> there is. I'll show it to you in just a second. There's a motor component of five in the palms. There's a motor nucleus of five in the palms. But, so what is proprioception of five, not only the, the face, but also your jaw, right? The oral cavity is, sensor, sensory information is carried over five. You know that your jaw is closed. Your T of J, the joint receptors and everything, right? So that's mesencephalic. So proprioception, touch, 
paint temperature. So when we start doing the physical exam this afternoon, when we do uh, sensation out of the periphery, we test two tracks. We test pain and touch because they go to different parts of the spinal cord, right? Pain is lateral funiculus, touch is dorsal column. Here, if you're testing touch or pain of the face, understand it's not different parts, medial or lateral, of the brain stem, it's cranial or caudal. If I'm testing touch, can you feel this? That's palms. If I'm testing pain of your face, then that's lower down. If you have a medullary problem, it's not going to affect touch for your face but it would affect you being able to perceive temperature or pinprick. This is a busy slide, but it's actually pretty easy. And it illustrates a point that's odd. There's an odd thing going on with five. I said that the trigeminal ganglion was like a dorsal root ganglion, right? So you've got all of these, there's the, first order cell right there coming in. There's the main nucleus. There's the spinal nucleus. They synapse on there. The second order crosses to the other side and goes up to the thalamus, just like the tracts of the body. But it's not the VPL nucleus of the thalamus. It's the VPM nucleus. The trigeminal nerve projects to the VPM nucleus. This little circle right here represents the motor nucleus of five right there. Now the oddball thing about five is when it comes to proprioception. Because the first order neuron is not located out in the trigeminal ganglion. It's located in the mesencephalon. It's a displaced ganglion. The first order neuron for proprioception of the face is inside the brainstem. It's the only sensation that's like that. It's the only somatic sensation that's like that. That's pretty cool. It has a short little axon that will synapse on the second order, which will then go to the VPM of the uh, thalamus. From the VPM of the thalamus, where do you think this information goes? The post central gyrus. Remember that homunculus where your face was depicted? Way out here, a huge amount of face was depicted? That's where it goes. If I touch your face right there, I can say, without doubt, the part of my cortex that's receiving that information is sitting right there. If I have a lesion right there, then I'm going to have a problem right there. Okay? Here's the VPM of the thalamus right there. There's the VPL, and there's the VPM. We'll go into these thalamic nuclei when we get there next week. The thing about this, though, is that sensation is bilateral. Just think of cranial nerves. Other than that one example of the facial nerve, Everything related to cranial nerves is bilateral. So when you have stroke, you don't lose sensation in your face. You would only lose sensation in your face if you have a brain stem lesion or a trigeminal lesion that affects the nerve itself. You know the funny thing about all of this? I, I would bet you guys a, a dollar 
that when you guys graduate, Hannah goes to work for a neurosurgeon. <laughs> I can get. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at her face. She's rolling her eyes, and rolling her head. I mean, how many times have I called on Hannah? Never. You know, never ever do I pick on Hannah. But she's back there. I mean, she's like having epilepsy in that chair that she loves us so much. Okay. But so here's something that might might make you a little happier. Here's something that might make. Let's put this to use. Let's put this to use. Let's put all of this neurocircuitry to use. Talking about cranial nerve five. Once it's synapsed in the main and spinal nucleus, there are collaterals that go other places besides the VPM. If we're talking about V1, you know the cornea, right? The cornea, we know that's innervated by V1. Ophthalmic division of V1 innervates the cornea. Herpes zoster ophthalmicus is B1, medical emergency. If I'm testing your corneal reflex, I'm going to hold your, comes up, tie it out, get you to look up. I'm going to come in from the bottom with a little wisp of cotton or something and touch your cornea. What do you do? You do that. You blink both your eyes and you open up, right? That's the blink reflex. So you just tested B1. Seven, three. Well, if you cut V1, hypothetically, if you cut V1, if I touch this side that it's cut on, nothing will happen because I can't feel it, right? But if I touch the other cornea, both sides will blink. Also, in Bell's palsy, Bell's palsy, there's nothing wrong with V1. If I have Bell's palsy on the right, if I touch this one, eye, the right affected side will not blink, because it can't, but the other side will. Is that not jacked up? You get somebody with a face injury, you pull their eye down, touch his cornea, and his other eye blinks. <laughs> this eye doesn't blink because he can't contract his orbicularis oculi, his Bell's palsy. That's kind of cool. Is Bell's palsy the one that can kind of clear up the bottom zone? Yes, 90, greater than 95% of the time. It's self-limited, it'll clear up on some weeks to months. Okay, the second bullet point here is that five also projects to the superior salivatory nucleus so that when you get, when you stimulate the cornea, it stimulates cranial nerve seven to cause lacrimation. Right? The next one down, five also projects to the superior and inferior salivary nucleus for salivation. You take a something and put it in your mouth so that temperature and touch are involved, you start to salivate. You throw in taste on top of it, and you're going to salivate more. There's a connection between five and the hypoglossal nerve. Five is your TMJs, where your teeth are in space. That has to communicate with your hypoglossal nerve to keep your tongue out of the way. And you don't have to think about it because it's a reflex. That's kind of cool. That last bullet point uh, is related to my grandmother. 
she would make chicken and dumplings. And I will not eat chicken and dumplings today because of her. Um, you know what chicken, everybody knows what chicken, anybody on earth not know what chicken and dumplings are? Okay. So Grandma was not very good about picking the chicken. So I'm eating the chicken and dumplings, and I'm thinking the consistency of the dumpling is, is like bread, you know, wet bread, and the consistency of the chicken is like chicken breast, and all of a sudden, you're thinking that things are going great, and then you bite down on a piece of cartilage. Because she didn't pick the chicken clean. All right? Five, which is the proprioceptors that's measuring and letting me be aware of bite force and everything, suddenly encounters something unexpected, it sends an impulse to the vagus, you got to get this out of your mouth. So you throw up. <laughs> and that's what that bullet point's about. And why I will not eat chicken and dumpling ever. My wife said, you know, I'll really pick the chicken out. No. I was so traumatized by my grandmother. <laughs> We're beyond that. A lot of the lesions of the brain stem involve uh, tumors. They're generally inoperable. You can't get to them, and everything else around them is so critical. Uh, you can't go messing around with them. So here are some examples of some pretty bad tumors here um, that you can see. The, uh, this protester this morning was t uh, get, telling you that most of the, 60% uh, I believe, of the tumors were in the posterior cranial fossa, which is where the brain stem is in pediatrics. So this is not a good thing. Okay. I'm not sure why I have this here. Let's see what things. Oh, okay. Mesencephalon. Mesencephalon. Uh, it's a very small area. There's really not much on the uh, ventral surface other than the cerebral peduncles. On the posterior surface, you have the uh, fourth nerve and you have um, the colliculi. If you look at this uh, section here, we're only dealing with this small area right here. Running in the, the mesencephalon is the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius or the cerebral aqueduct. The, if you're going to have an obstructive type of hydrocephalus, the mesencephalon is the place where it's most likely to happen because the, the lumen of that aqueduct is so small. If we look at the fourth nerve, so we're all the way up to the fourth, we did the fifth nerve, now we're up to the fourth nerve. The fourth nerve, the trochlear nerve, is um, here are the cerebral peduncles here. There's the fourth nerve right there. It's a motor nerve, so it's going to be midline, right? This one does something, two things that all the other cranial nerves don't do. One is that it exits the brainstem dorsally, and two, it crosses before it exits. Well, it crosses up there before it exits. So if you have a, a lesion of cranial nerve, what does the cranial nerve 4 go to? Yeah. Superior oblique. If you have a problem walking downstairs, yeah. or reading a book, or working on a computer, and you diagnose a superior oblique problem on the right, understand that the lower motor neuron is on the left. It's not going to be above that. The lesion won't be above that because it's bilaterally innervated. If you have a fourth nerve problem or a superior oblique problem, the problem has to be at the nucleus of the nerve. While we're on this slide, sitting between the uh, 
cerebral uh, peduncles, also called the crew cerebri. And the substance of the mesencephalon here is the substantia nigra. Now, here's, um, we're going to move up just a tiny bit more, and you're going to get into the third nerve. There's the MLF, there's the third nucleus right there, and the third nerve exiting medially. Remember how it exits medially? You can see it right there, kind of between the cerebral peduncles. A couple of things that are uh, present in this slide that we know, one of them is the medial meniscus. There's a substantia nigra. And behind the substantia nigra is a big nucleus here called the red nucleus. That's the origin of the rubrospinal tract that I mentioned yesterday. The third cranial nerve has two components. It has the components going to all of the other extraocular eye movement muscles plus the levator palpebrae superioris, right, that opens, the eye, opens your eye. If you look at the third nucleus there, the specific regions of the nucleus go to specific muscles. It's just not random. There's nothing in the nervous system that's random. I mean, it may appear to you. Right? <laughs> the rest of us are on the same page. Okay. Amanda, no, you're you're on you're on Team Hannah. Team Hannah. We're on Team Hannah. <laughs> team Dan. We're on Team Dan. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You don't, you, don't, you don't need to uh, memorize these nuclei. What you, need to, what you need to know is that the third nerve is in the mesencephalon and it innervates everything else besides the superior oblique and the lateral rectus. Third nerve is kind of interesting. because of the other component, and that would be, why, it is, I said it has two components. Yeah, and then I said, what's the other component? And she said, raising her eyelid. No, 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 that's oh. all somatic. That's all, that's all somatic efferent. The other component is the, the parasympathetic component. The parasympathetic nucleus of three is called the Edinger-Westfall nucleus. It's my favorite nucleus. <laughs> the editor westfall nucleus sends preganglion parasympathetic fibers out to the third nerve. Remember the ciliary ganglion? <laughs> <laughs> no, I give up. <laughs> like 40 more slides to go, so hang in there. <laughs> you got an extra whole day to study this stuff. Okay. So the ciliary ganglia, you know the ciliary ganglia, it goes to the pupil. It goes to the, that's what dilates and contracts the pupil thing. The parasympathetic, what is it going to do? Think, think, think. Fight or flight. If you're running, you want to why. So parasympathetics contract down. Right? Yeah. So they contract down. That's the parasympathetic component. There's a test that we're going to talk about here in the next four or five hours. That if I take uh, something out here and I move it into here, what happens? Well, my, my 
eyes have to rotate medially to follow it in, right? Medial rectus is supplied by what? Three. Three. That's the somatic component of three. But also, my pupils have to get smaller. That's accommodation. So convergence and accommodation, cranial of three. What? <laughs> Because we're going to start talking about hookers here in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Which kind? The horse. Actually, horse. No, no. <laughs> oh, Argyle Roberson pupil. There you go. I didn't even know what was on there. So what happens with Argyle Robinson pupils? Neurosyphilis. You know Tavis dorsalis? That's neurosyphilis. They have Argyle Robinson pupils. So what they can do is they can, they, really they call them the prostitutes pupil or other names, is that when you do that, your eyes can accommodate, I mean they can converge, they can accommodate in and get small like they're supposed to. But then if you shine the light in their eye, it won't react. So it's like a prostitute. It will accommodate you. And they will react to you. <laughs> that's, that's, Google it. Google it. You don't believe it. I didn't make I this believe, up. I believe you. Look very careful. <laughs> I think they kicked me off uh, Wi Fi for good. That's, that's, that's the mnemonic for it. Is, they, is, is that not said? Yes, yeah, it is. I didn't make it up. I didn't invent that. I'm telling you people, if you guys are getting ready to visit a prostitute who's walking like this, you better run the other way. Right? Why do y'all keep pointing the ball? something for you here. I got something for you here. Let's cut the optic nerve right here. If you have a lesion, if you have a lesion of that optic nerve, you see all this connection down here? If you have a lesion of that optic nerve, if I shine a light in that eye, nothing's going to happen because you're blind. But if I shine a light in this eye, this pupil will still constrict, even though you're blind in that eye. That's kind of cool. I mean, not really, but I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact. What about this nucleus? I just like the name, Edinger Westfall. I don't know who these guys are, but I'd like to have a beer with them. <laughs> Edinger Westfall. So if you if you look at okay, so the four parasympathetic nuclei of the cranial nerves. Remember back in anatomy, I had a box around the cranial nerves. I said these are parasympathetic. Carrie remembers. We got the dorsal motor nucleus of 10, inferior salivatory, superior salivatory, adding a Westfall. There you go. And onus nucleus down in the sacrum that I mentioned the other day, that's the parasympathetic to the S234. There you go. Now you know them all. Thank you. Good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The optic track for um, we're good, we're we'll get there. Okay. okay. This was crater three, really. All right, the substantia nigra. <coughs> the substantia nigra is made up of two parts. Um, there's a receptive part where it's receiving information from like the caudate that I mentioned yesterday the GABAergic neurons from the caudate. 
and there is a projection part. There are two neurons, two types of neurons that come out of the substantia nigra. One contains dopamine, one contains acetylcholine. They both go back to the caudate. Dopamine is inhibitory, acetylcholine is excitatory. So remember I was talking about this neuron here being a shape of a pyramid, pyramidal tract, the pyramid, corticospinal. So there are two motor systems. There's the corticospinal tract, the pyramidal system, and then there's everything else. We're going to call everything else extra pyramidal. The extra pyramidal system modulates the pyramidal system, because the corticospinal tract is your voluntary motor system, right? What do you say? The corticospinal tract, I, I said it yesterday when I was describing it. Was it yesterday? Two uh, days ago? Okay. I said the corticospinal tract was your voluntary motor system, right? So everything else modulate. Why? Remember this thing where I threw this thing up? Yes. That's corticospinal tract. Everything else is telling me to, to lift it like that. If you put a lesion in the corticospinal tract, you're paralyzed. If I put a lesion in the extrapyramidal stuff, you're not paralyzed, but the motor activity is not going to be normal. The substantia nigra is part of the ectopyramidal system. If you lesion that, what was the disease if you lesion the substantia nigra? Parkinson's. What do Parkinson's people do? They tremor. They have a resting tremor. We'll go more into the, this uh, detail about this later on. Why do they have a tremor? Because you've removed the inhibition. You remove the inhibitory neurons. Now all you got left is the excitatory neurons. You can't be still. Well, that's what the term is, it's like a pill rolling. And then they, they have all sorts of things that go wrong with it. Okay? Huntington's is the same way. They can't control if it's a tremor. It's more of a chorea form movements or more uh, um, uh, gross. You know, they're, um, they can either be writhing or flailing like movements like that. Parkinson's is more of a small tremor. And there are two types of tremors, uh, whether or not they exist at rest. You know, with a Parkinson's disease, if, if if I have Parkinson's disease and I'm like this, it's resting tremor. So if my arm is at rest like that and I'm moving, if I'm going to move, what functions in movement? What part of the nervous system? Say it. <laughs> I've only asked you this 12 times today already. It's the cerebellum. <laughs> the answer is always the cerebellum. <laughs> <laughs> if I lesion, if I lesion the substantia nigra, it's a resting tremor. But when I start moving, the tremor goes away. Because what takes over movement, I mean, what takes over muscle contraction in movement? The cerebellum. If I have a cerebellar lesion, the exact opposite happens. If I have a cerebellar lesion, I'm sitting here like this, not tremoring, but as soon as I try to go for that urn, that's when the, that's when the tremor starts. That's the water bottle. That's the difference between a resting tremor, which is substantia nigra. Substantia nigra is part of another system called basal ganglia. We'll talk about that. Basal ganglia lesions are resting tremors. Cerebellar lesions are intention tremors. See? 
crazy. The, you know, the funny thing about Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, you name it, all these tremors, and they can't stop them. You can't not make yourself tremor. When you go to sleep, they all go away. You never tremor when you're asleep. That's cool, huh? You can have the worst Huntington's disease in the world, and you just, you know, you're, you're near death because your, your uh, motor function is so bad. So as you go to sleep, nothing. That's cool, huh? Okay. It's not a guy smoking weed and stuff. I'm sorry? <laughs> it's not a guy on YouTube, a grandpa or whatever, that smoked weed and it stopped. I'm going to come and talk to this side of the house. <laughs> Actually, uh, there is a uh, thing called a familial tremor. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Well, familiar tremor is. Um, I have a friend, a dear friend of mine, he, um, he's like, it's not Parkinson's disease, it's, it's both a resting tremor and an intention tremor. And the more fine the movement he tries to make, like if you're um, trying to bait a hook or tie a fishing knot, the worse it is. And the, the funny thing about that is probably the tremor you're talking about, is if you drink two beers, it goes away. You don't have to go to sleep. Drink two beers, it goes away. So, and familiar, it's familial, so it's an inherited thing. Um, and if you have it in your family, just get Uncle Uncle Joe when you go home at Christmas or whenever you go home. Drink a couple of beers. Um, okay, so um, I'll give you a couple of The reason this slide is up here is to show you the inferior colliculi. Uh, because here are the inferior colliculi here. I said they were related, they're a relay nucleus related to hearing. And the only thing we're going to talk about hearing right now is that uh, here's the cochlear uh, spiral ganglion right there. Comes into the dorsal and ventral cochlear nucleus. Immediately it goes bilateral. In the uh, pontomedullary junction, it's bilateral. It goes bilateral all the way up these nuclei. By the time it gets to the temporal lobe, that's called the that uh, right there. That's called the transverse gyrus of Heschel, H-E-S-C-H-L. Transverse gyrus of Heschel. That's your primary auditory cortex. It's so bilateral, you will never lose hearing with a stroke. It stays tonotopic, though. If you look at the, I think when we talked about the, the cochlea back in ENT, talked about the basal tones being one part of the spiral, the uh, treble being the other part, that, main, that relationship maintains itself all the way up to the cortex, where the treble, the high notes, are here medially. The bass notes are lateral in, in Heschel's gyrus. If we look at the uh, visual pathway, and I'm only going to talk about this in relation to um, the superior colliculus. We'll talk more about it when we get up there to the thalamus. Uh, but here you have the uh, rods and cones, their inner neurons, and then you have the uh, ganglion cells here that give rise to the optic nerve. These ganglion cells are bipolar. They project back, they, their retinal cells essentially, project, their main projection site is to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. But they also project to the superior colliculi. The superior colliculi also project and receive projections from the occipital lobe and the inferior colliculi. So they're all kind of uh, intertwined together. Their vision is intertwined with a lot of stuff. You, know, you can kind of think of it this way. I said the tectospinal tract originated from the superior colliculus, goes to the cervical muscles. If I see a flash, you know, something out of this eye here, then, then I turn to look at it. So follow me here. 
I see something. So I have to see it. The superior colliculus does not see. But I see it in my cortex. My cortex interprets it. That sends the information down to my superior colliculus that causes me to react. If I'm standing here looking at Taylor, and April here is makes a movement, then I see that, but I'm not reacting to that. But if she were to pull out her chopper, <laughs> then that's something I see, I've interpreted it with my occipital lobe, and then my tectospinal tract says, oh crap. See, there's a, you know, it doesn't, the superior colliculus doesn't see, but it receives sight through the visual pathway. And it's, you know, because we're talking about little short distance here, it's instantaneous, or seems instantaneous. And that's all really I gotta say about the brainstem. <laughs> Why don't you go get a cocktail or two, <laughs> and then we'll, you know, take 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back here and start the diet. Okay, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. We'll have a good time. Thank you. That's how I was feeling before lunch. So, you know what? Like I had a headache and just couldn't look at me.